everyone. Welcome to Wired and Wonderful. I'm Brittany Osteen. And my name's Emily Zakonis. And we're your conference co uh, co coordinators. Um, so we are so happy that you guys could all join us here today at West Virginia University. And we're so excited to learn all about the reach of digital storytelling and um, this weekend. We encourage everyone to take advantage of every aspect of the conference um, that it has to offer. Learn from every session, showcase your skills with the day competition, and make as many new connections as you can. There's tons of people from all over the country here, so make sure you talk to everybody. Um, and then, yeah, so just some general announcements before we like get started and really dive in. Um, just so everybody knows, if you need to use the restroom, you're gonna exit out the back that way, and you're gonna come all the way around the corner, you're gonna see a water fountain, and then right behind that is where the restrooms are. Um, there's also a leadership summit following this, so if you are currently a student leader or you're looking to become a student leader, we really encourage you to stay for that. It's going to be super beneficial. We have awesome speakers. Um, tomorrow, when you guys arrive, there's also going to be registration open for our day of competition. This is actually going to allow you to practice some skills and actually build a campaign for a client and work with a group of students you may not work with every single day. So be on the lookout for that tomorrow. Um, we also have our post-grad networking session tomorrow. So you have business cards, bring them, get ready to meet new people, and bring some fun facts about yourself. We're excited to meet you guys and have you here. All right, so thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, we are going to introduce our keynote, Alex McPherson. Um, Alex was, for ten, nearly 10 years, um, using social and digital analytics to refine client strategy and inform brand health and awareness at Methods and Mastery, a specialty agency within Fleshman Hillard Global Network, Alex works to bring the best out of the top brands, including YouTube and Google. So, thank you so much. Let's get started with Alex McPherson. Thank you. Thank you all as well. Let's see. I may actually attempt to just speak very loudly, um, and, and, and let me know if I need to use the microphone, but I, I think I can probably manage this without. Um, but again, thank you very much for uh, having me here today. It's fantastic to be back here at West Virginia University. Um, uh, luckily, two times grad in both PR and the data marketing communications program. And uh, just in general, uh, it is, I guess, fantastic to see a light um, presentation here. So data, uh, oh, can I, oh, we're recording. Well, then that's very good, too. I, I apologize. I'm already, I'm already ruining things. Sorry, Alex. You should wrap it up. Okay, so. I do. Well, here, we can throw this over here. All right. Can you all hear me all right, then? I won't speak quite as loudly. All right. I've very, I'm very hand movement oriented. But, uh, but again, welcome to my presentation. Uh, everything is everything. Um, essentially, start here. Data. Data is everywhere, and literally everything is data. The number of people in this room today is data. The number of power outlets, chairs, the, all of these just immense amount of social metrics in general. Um, it's unfathomable the amount of things that you have to try to keep track of day to day in the world, especially in a marketing context these days. And overall, it, while it is a, a bit of a challenge, that's where there's a fun, fun aspect where you basically get to be a treasure hunter in this overall career of marketing. You're going to be digging and trying to find what is that little gold nugget that is going to help inform the next big sort of strategy insight and your own clients and uh, campaign, and as well as your own sort of progress in improving what the work you do is, the agency you work for, everything. Uh, again, very fascinating time to be here. But first, let's talk a little about methods and mastery. What the heck is this? So I assume a lot of you probably have maybe heard of Fleischman Hillard. Um, luckily, uh, PR Week, very recent, uh, large agency of the year, uh, just a couple years ago, or not a couple of years ago, a couple of weeks ago. And right here, so Methods and Mastery is brand new. We are about a year old, um, and it is a new specialty agency inside of, essentially, or a subsidiary of Fleischman Hillard. I like to think of it a little bit like, perhaps like uh, the A team or like SEAL Team 6 of uh, Fleischmann Hillard. We get to do a lot of very cool, innovative things um, that help push really the what's, what's even possible right now in what we're doing with data. And creative and strategy and content. We do a lot of things. So as you see here, troop of artists, architects, planners, and plotters, and tinkerers working as one. Again, we do use data as the foundation. We try to take as many different aspects of research and strategy to really truly inform 
every small, tiny aspect of the things we do, to even the color of the content on the copy, how many faces, how many people we have and things. Um, there are so many different sort of variables you can be looking at, and we try to hone in on every single one of them. We are right now in about five different locations, uh, a small 36 of us across the globe here, um, and again, doing our best for all of our clients, which are on the slide after this. Um, other things that we do, so again, these are a lot of the different types of uh, work that we essentially hone in on. So business intelligence, you have performance reporting, crisis and escalations, and there's also plenty of things that aren't on here. So as an example, we're also starting to hone in on uh, new data sources that haven't been used as frequently, especially in a marketing capacity recently. Um, things like uh, we're honing into Twitter's own API to basically, technical terms, to basically ingest a number of tweets for various things to then provide dashboards for our clients to help give them ideas. Uh, in one example, for instance, on maybe what musical artists would be best to partner with. Um, we're, we're really, we, so with that, again, hired a data scientist, and we're trying to really push the, the envelope on what is, again, possible in the types of work we can do. Here's a sort of a list of some of our clients. We're currently working across a lot of the different clients uh, within the Google ecosystem, all these different ones, as well as the YouTube ecosystem. Um, while YouTube, for instance, is one giant thing, um, it is made up of so many different parts a YouTube music product. There's a, a TV product now that is competing with things like PlayStation View. You have uh, YouTube Kids, even a sort of YouTube gaming platform. So while uh, even in some cases with, let's say, gaming, there's an individual website, there's the individual teams within this. And, and they might need to know specifically about what's happening in the overall gaming space to help give them suggestions around what influencers to work with, et cetera. My bread and butter, though, is YouTube music, and that's what I'll be mostly talking about today. Um, you might not be familiar with YouTube music, as it, too, is fairly new. So basically, it was May of last year, YouTube music, it was something before, but it relaunched into a brand new um, app and service and overall uh, sort of uh, website location that uh, competes, very, uh, well, competes with Spotify and Tidal and Apple Music and all of those. Um, it, it is sort of more than just music on YouTube, essentially. Um, and you can, you have albums, playlists, all these things, but there's also the benefit of things like the music videos. You can watch all of those and search them. There's, you know, creative search features. So you could say, happy music, and it's gonna give you a whole list. Uh, it also, since it taps directly into YouTube itself, it's exciting in the way that, you know, when you say happy music, or let's say Swedish metal music, Playlists that other people have made on YouTube are, are within the service, too. So within that, like, you know, if you search, which I have as a test, Swedish metal music, you've, you have a playlist of about 70 different songs that you probably wouldn't have found previously. Um, but again, uh, the, that, the goal of these things, effortless discovery, the music you want, uh, it's a, an exciting product, but also a challenging product because it's a saturated market right now. You have Spotify, who's been really around for I think around 15, maybe more, maybe closing in on 20 years, um, and Apple Music has come in fast. There are all of these different competitors, so finding out what is, what is the niche that you have and how do you overall help improve not just the, the presence of YouTube Music, but help convince uh, consumers, we'll use the, the term, uh, to give it a try, consider switching. Uh, it's, it is a challenge, so uh, we're gonna use the best of the best data and insights we can to, to solve that. Um, and we'll give you some examples of what we found. Real quick, I'm gonna give you some terms of the trade. So these are some terms that you may not initially be familiar with, but I'll probably be using them a lot, so I just wanna make sure that uh, they're well known. I'm just gonna take a quick sec to read them out, because again, this will be important for some of the various things I just say. Um, benchmarking, essentially that established set of metrics used to compare one set of data with another, bent metrics growths, just gives us a baseline of knowing did we do good or you know, better than the past. Uh, followers, that's just easy, social followers on Twitter, Facebook, uh, or subscribers of YouTube, essentially. Uh, engagement, in that case, it's actions that people are taking on social media. So in that framework, you have likes, shares, retweets, comments. Sometimes things like link clicks can be considered engagements. Uh, but for the most part, when I'm saying engagements, I'm going to be meaning those ones right there. 
Uh, we have mentions. Whenever we say mentions, it's sort of whenever somebody's talking about you on the internet. Um, could be a tweet, could be a blog, could be a news site. Uh, we have share of voice, uh, which essentially it's based on mentions. So your mentions in sort of the online marketplace, how many times people are, are you know, mentioning your brand out there. Uh, and then these last two, and we're going to hit on these a lot. Um, and this is definitely one of the things that I hope you take home, which is the difference between what is a fact and what is an insight. Um, it's something that uh, it, it's, for me, I've learned a lot about the sort of difference over the last couple of years. When you're researching, you'll stumble upon something and you'll be like, oh, it looks like, uh, you know, posting this type of post, uh, you know, maybe there's uh, two people in it, looks like that uh, maybe boosted a thing. So the boost itself is a fact, but that idea that there was two people in it, that's more of maybe the insight. So again, fact, something that is known or has been proven to be true. Insight, a trend or general learning that can be used to guide strategy. And a quick example of that. A fact, an insight can come from anything at any time. Um, and that's something, again, we'll, we'll prove out a little more in these next slides. And then an insight here, stay curious. If an insight can come from anything, be curious enough to look through everything. All right, we'll jump in. So essentially, I'm going to give you three different uh, overarching sort of cases that help uh, prove out, one, the fact insight basis, but also gives you a look at what it was like inside essentially the first year of YouTube music and the things that we've sort of learned along the way. We'll start off here. So in this, this case, there's sort of three different elements. You have lovely pictures on the far left-hand side. You have Sean Mendez. And then what that represents there is um, with Sean Mendez, we partnered with him to do an artist spotlight, which was a small documentary, essentially, about, uh, about him. Um, the next one, the band BTS, um, the most popular K-pop band out there. Um, and their fans are rabid and all over the internet and love BTS. We post about them a lot, um, as one would. Uh, and then the lastly, the Latin Grammys. Um, we also partnered with the Latin Grammy Awards this year to help, um, what would, we supported, I'll well, say, the Latin Grammy Awards um, and posted uh, not just about a number of the artists, we have a lot of partnerships with a lot of Latin artists, um, but we also celebrated Latin History Month as part of it. And basically, over the course of about a week and a half, posted a bunch of different content around that. So again, cases, three different sort of examples. And in this, we'll take a quick look at what each of them sort of do from different aspects of metrics, because they do very different things. So starting off, mentions. So as you can see, the sort of color coding across here, um, basically the yellow represents each time we posted about BTS. Um, the orange there is about uh, basically that Shawn Mendes artist spotlight, which also included a sort of contest that gave you the opportunity if you commented in on our social post, you got a chance to, uh, about why you love Sean, you got to, a chance to basically get flown out to see him perform live at the debut of this artist spotlight. And then the last one, the Grammys. So as you can see, a longer sort of period, but um, our sort of overall social support through that. Um, and, and sort of take a look at the individual spikes, and you can start to get an idea as you analyze these things one by one, what sort of actions that we are taking are creating actions in, in what people are doing online. Um, so you see with Sean Mendez posting about that event, a lot of people are extremely excited about the fact that if they, they sort of engage with this content, they get a chance to see Sean, or just excited, they get to see a new documentary of Sean. Um, you also have BTS, so you can see the individual spikes right there. I will I'll give you an insider tip. Always look for outliers, too. 10-7, uh, uh, around that sort of area there. That was also the American Music Awards. So some of the spikes you'll see there represent not only actually that, that BTS post we did because they were at the American Music Awards, um, but this sort of other event too. So in that case, that large mention spike there, that doesn't entirely represent BTS, it's, it's a conglomerate. So little things to look for. Um, and then the Grammys, again, uh, a fair amount of sort of mention spiking around there. Looking at this from another angle, post engagements. Um, as you can see, there was a, a fair number of sort of post engagements with the sort of Shawn Mendes aspect. There was a sort of a, a, a little bit of an increase, but also a, um, uh, you know, a, a elongated amount for the Grammys right there. But, but really sort of puts it out of place. Again, if you look at the, that left-hand side and that key, those are 50,000 engagements. So it's a, it's a fair, fair number there. So, you know, right about there, 
that's, you know, you're still getting, you know, maybe 30,000 in that neighborhood. But if you look at BTS, those spikes just jump up because people love BTS. They're, it's all the likes, it's all the retweets, and especially around their first appearance at the American Music Awards, their fans were rabid about it. And then finally here, follower growth. So another thing to, to keep, an, keep an idea on, an aspect on. And with that Shawn Mendes one, follower growth um, spiked out, basically out of the roof, in that you can see basically single day, 5,000 new Twitter followers um, because we were um, doing this activity. There's a chance, honestly, that we might have gotten more. Um, nowhere within this contest was there a, a sort of follow to comment. Um, it was just asking them to comment, but people were excited that we were doing these kinds of things, so they followed anyway. Um, that's sort of one of those learnings that we might recommend later is, is maybe in the next contest. You do a sort of, you gotta, you follow, you use the hashtag, maybe say a comment, um, and, and again, just depends on how you wanna boost things up. Um, but uh, what I was always specifically very interested in is if you look at the BTS areas, while there was that spike around the American Music Awards, I'm gonna ruin, I'm, I apologize, I'm gonna ruin your video because I'm just going back and forth with my head. Um, so with the American Music Awards, a little bit of a spike there, but again, because we were doing a lot of different things. But on those regular days, yeah, people are engaging like crazy, but they're not necessarily following our account. Um, so it's creating a different type of action. We're, we're asking essentially people to do different things. And we'll now look at these all at once, and you can start to see little bits of patterns. Um, of, of what this t different types of content does and asks people to do as well, um, which we'll say uh, leads us to our first fact. Different activities, all of these different things, whether it's a, a sweep sweepstakes kind of action, whether it's appealing to a large fan base, or whether it's doing a sort of multifaceted activation like the Latin Grammys, which appealed to fan bases and which sort of celebrated different things and got artists to partner with us, they're gonna drive very different actions. But that's a fact, that doesn't necessarily tell us a um, strategy that we're gonna sort of dive into. This is, this is just a fun one for me. Social content is a choose your own adventure. So within the overarching sort of aspect of, of maybe what YouTube music wants to do in the future, if they have a sudden goal that they want to reach a certain number of followers, well, maybe they should do a couple more contests. If they have a goal that they want to be extremely highly engaged, find those specific fan bases and those fan audiences and, and, and really help support them. Be a fan yourself. Um, and if you maybe want a really balanced thing, um, that's where, you know, celebrate things like Latin History Month. Um, all of these things just to, to you, you, it is all, always a brand's decision what they are going for. Um, and uh, they can go for anything. We'll go a little deeper into uh, some, some other metrics. I want to make sure I don't get feedback there. I'm also going to take a drink of water. So how do we get noticed? We're actually going to go back to Sean Mendez in that artist spotlight. Um, so again, it was a very exciting sort of event. Um, it, it had a component that was, first of all, just announcing that the artist spotlight was happening. Um, there was also a great sort of synergy at the launch in the framework that both Sean Mendez and um, uh, popular, popular YouTube influencer Casey Neistat directed the overall, um, the, the overall documentary. Uh, and it was about a 20 minute documentary. Um, and within, within that, they posted about the same time. So you had Sean Mendez, Casey Neistat, and YouTube Music, um, and YouTube, all posting at the exact same time um, that this was happening, which created a big swell of, uh, of, of obviously mentions and uh, people paying attention um, because they were getting hit from all these places at once. Um, and then in addition to that, you had the contest aspect. And then it was about a week between that period when you then announced it. So you created a, a lot of sort of buzz um, with a couple different strategies all at the same time. And this event blew things out of the water. Here's some examples of basically the, the different fairly large scale metrics. Um, and honestly, in this case, the most important ones are those percentages. So versus benchmarks of other artist spotlights. One of the previous ones we did, for instance, was with Camilla Cabela. 45% um, uh, more mentions versus that individual benchmark. Um, would I say owned impressions there? Um, owned is, uh, so basically from our social posts. So four different YouTube uh, music posts, essentially, those were real eyes on it, um, not necessarily. There's some cases where you have to estimate followers based on the following of an account, but 
those were 5.6 million people who really did see that and, and was watching it happen. You also have, again, a lot of engagements. The plus 100, basically 1,080 percent, like it's hard to even conceptualize those sort of growths, but with the average engagements that we were receiving on things, and also a fair number of Instagram story views. But there was one specific metric that underperformed at a, at a fair rate, and the question here is why? That's a lot of Instagram story views, but it's 30 percent less than our average benchmark. And we had a very good benchmark to use with this. Another activation with Sean Mendez. Why would this new one that was him performing live, and, and it was an Instagram story of his live performance in launching this artist documentary, why would that have performed worse, perhaps, than um, what was an event where Sean Mendez, with YouTube Music Support, helped, uh, it was called the Rolling Stone Relaunch Party. Um, and again, had an Instagram story about that. Why, why would that be different at all? We, we had to sort of start, start digging. Um, and beyond that, we had another benchmark, Alan Walker. I'm going to guess most of you probably don't know who Alan Walker is. He's an EDM artist. Um, again, a lot lesser known than the highly popular Shawn Mendes. Why would his, he, we, we supported his birthday bash. And uh, there was an Instagram story of, of that performance. Why would that birthday bash have performed so much better than, again, this, this sort of massively uh, you know, shared and event that got really knocked it on the park out of every single other metric. We had to start digging. And, and with that, we were very fortunate that uh, we tracked down really every single thing we do, every possible individual little metric that we mentioned before on that very first data slide, the whole sort of wash of them. We try to keep track. We keep track of the posts that we do, that the artists do. We keep track of, again, as much as you can, because you never know in the future what's going to be important. And I certainly didn't, you know, before we then were digging to find out what happened during this, uh, you know, the, the last Shawn Mendes event. And the answer was actually pretty simple. Why? I knew I would do that. We didn't post about it on Twitter. In both of the other cases, the Rolling Stone relaunch and the Ellen Walker birthday bash, we basically reminded people that we have an Instagram story and that there's something cool that maybe you want to look at and that you want to see and pay attention to on the Instagram story as well. Um, we, uh, and again, in this case, you know, the Rolling Stone relaunch, uh, some behind the scenes. Um, but yeah, with the other Sean Mendes, we just honestly don't think of it. Comes to this fact. Audiences can't watch content that they don't know exists. It's, it's a pretty obvious one in, in some cases. And it's one that we have made sure to stick to in every single other major sort of next Instagram story thing that we have done. Um, but we want to get our, get our remind people. There, there's a case that even if you follow YouTube Music on Instagram, you're probably not just clicking that story to see what's up with them. You're going to do that with your friends, but maybe not a brand. Um, but if you do post something to Twitter, you're not just capturing um, people who follow you already on Instagram, but you're catching the entirety of, say, Sean Mendez, Sean Mendez's audience. Um, and, and they're sort of reminded that there's a cool thing that no one else has that if you just click this little link to the Instagram story, you can go find it. So the insight there, drive audiences across your channels for the maximum exposure. Some of these things, they're, they're not incredibly complex, but what they are is uh, it's good, always good reminders to, to what, again, you can do just to help support your, the brand work in any framework that you can possibly get it. I'm sure I can tell I'm talking fast. All right, and then here, who are our competitors? And this honestly has been one of our uh, sort of most interesting and honestly one of the sort of learnings that we've had that has driven overall some of the most strategy for us. YouTube Music, again, not incredibly old in this, in this case. We were doing some end of year reporting to give a bit of an idea of where YouTube Music sat amongst these competitors. Um, and between the period of the May 17th announcement that there was going to be a product and January 1st, 2 million mentions. So a fair chunk, a lot of people talking online, 
YouTube Music, sharing links to the overall, overall platform. But how does that compare with things like Spotify? Very smallly, it turns out. Um, about 2%, so a lot of these uh, competitors here sitting, sitting a lot smaller. And again, this is just from the framework of overall social mentions. Again, plenty of different metrics. This is not the number of sort of daily active users of, of these platforms or the subscribers. This is just who is talking about it online. Um, but Spotify has built up a good framework, especially in the case of in-app, um, basically sharing of all of the songs you're listening to. Um, and, and it's something that is honestly daunting. It's a daunting thing to try to catch up with when you're sort of much later into the market um, than other things. Um, and even Apple Music, again, it's, it's, that's a massive product, but Spotify is just a sort of a behemoth here. So we really wanted to think deeply around what, you know, what do you tell a client? How do you give them recommendations around um, how they can you know, catch up from 2%, um, which I will say has since then grown above title, but 2% at that point to 68%. And I ended up getting, in this case, inspiration from a place that I never would have thought I would have which turned out to be Netflix's earnings report. Uh, via Paul, I read it on Polygon, but in the 2018 earnings report, estimated that they, Netflix commands 10% of television screen time in the US and slightly less than that for mobile time. And they told us basically who they thought their competitor was. And it's Fortnite. It's not HBO. It's not Hulu. It's, you know, it's Fortnite because from the standpoint of Netflix, they're thinking in that case, they're not competing necessarily for people who are watching overall like television shows. They're literally competing for eyes on a screen and, and your time. Um, so in that case, they again compete to, and lose to Fortnite more than HBO. Again here, screen time, basically I said that. Uh, it's the most valuable metric. And you know, there's just an endless different options. And I loved this one. In October, I believe it was, yeah, when YouTube went down globally for, and it was literally about five minutes, there was a spike in subscriptions to Netflix, if you, if you think of that. People got bored for about five minutes, couldn't, couldn't access their YouTube, and thought, I'll try out Netflix. That'll be fun. Um, so you sort of never, never know who your competitors are unless you really sort of deeply think about it, which then, again, brought into the case of, of who, here we go. Who is YouTube Music's true competitor? Um, in this framework for YouTube Music, what we would consider to be a competitor is a streaming music service. People who are looking for music on their, on their phones or online, um, just they, they want to sort of digitally stream and listen to music. That is, that is the action they're attempting to do, so that's going to be the time that they take. May, may surprise you. It's YouTube. They are their own competitor. Um, because more often than not, people aren't looking for YouTube Music, this brand new app. They are looking for music on YouTube. And that's what the share of voice looks like when you then break it out differently. Spotify, up at 68% before, itself becomes a little bit dwarfed by the amount of people who are searching for music and talking about artists and overall just looking for a, a sort of music listening experience online. Um, and people turn to YouTube a lot for that. Um, one of my favorite sort of things uh, about you know, people who are looking for things on YouTube, there, there's also Reddit communities and things of, let's say, writers who are looking to find inspiration for the things they're writing. And they'll make whole playlists just of, of YouTube songs that they're sort of looking for with these things. An ex good, another good example of, of how this sort of worked in action was Jay Balvin. So uh, YouTube has a pretty good relationship and partnership with the, uh, the artist Jay Balvin. Um, last year, YouTube Music partnered with him a number of times, um, and which culminated in about, um, for, from this standpoint, him mentioning YouTube Music six different times. Um, but for Spotify, it's, uh, it's a bit more. Jay Balvin ended up mentioning Spotify four times more than YouTube Music in that, in that same time frame. Um, which, you know, in, in a lot of the cases, um, it didn't appear to be a, a sort of solid partnership like the one that we had done. It was just him mentioning the brand. But he mentioned YouTube 1.5 times more than Spotify. 
<coughs> so it then led into what do we end up doing to try to ch change this overarching uh, behavior of things? How do we make that little 1% much closer to the 56%? And then here's this fact. Most audiences, they do turn to YouTube before YouTube music. And honestly, a lot of people don't know YouTube music exists. So there's a bit of an education barrier there. So our insight here was promoting growth really meant changing behavior. And that's a lot of behavior. That's changing behavior of artists in general, consumers, and just the industry at large uh, to, again, help support this, this brand new product. So in that case of changing the behavior of artists, it's, it's having Jay Balvin say, hey, if you don't mind, would you post about at YouTube Music, not just at YouTube? Uh, would, you, would you maybe post like a, a playlist or something that, uh, of, of your content? Or when you share an, your, your album or your new single, maybe, maybe that's inside of YouTube Music, not the new YouTube video. With consumers, uh, overall, it's, it's again, it's just sort of helping, helping that education. And with the industry, it's really helping make and enrich the partnerships between the record labels, between all of the artists, between you know, festivals, every facet, essentially, of, of you know, the YouTube music experience that we can um, to, to really sort of push home this idea that um, YouTube music, while it is an app and it's a service, it is also becoming its own brand and helping support that. I'm going real short, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, if you all don't ask a lot of questions, I'm, I have some other thoughts on things like Fortnite, so we'll be good. There are three lessons I would love, love, love if you all sort of took home from this. And essentially, the first one here is that. that the, a fact isn't an insight. Um, the insight is, what's that next step? What's the next thing you're doing and the next route you're ending up taking after you, you, know, you, you identify what that fact is? The next one, everything matters. Everything is everything. Because an insight can come from anywhere at every time. And if you're not paying attention to everything, if you're not really digging into things, you may not capture you know, what that sort of hidden nugget is. And then that last one is always stay curious. That's what I have. I, uh, so, so first, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions, but also from there, um, I have plenty of other various anecdotes and things about cool things Methods and Mastery is doing, other industries that we think are really boosting up. Um, plenty, plenty of time for us to just sort of chat and, uh, and you know, ask as many things as you want. So. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, go for it. Is social media your greatest driver for gaining exposure for YouTube music, or what mm -hmm. route are you taking exactly? Yeah, so right now, and what I will say is, uh, in the way we work with YouTube music right now, I work directly for their social team. So for me personally, that, that is the thing that I'm looking at the most. But, you know, YouTube music does use, a, a, you know, it's multifaceted. Like, there, there's, you know, some various paid promotion. We have other sort of marketing, um, you know, even, you know, doing creative things with like Rolling Stone and these other sort of brand avenues. So while I get the opportunity most of the time to really dive in and, and try to understand especially what is happening on that social front and how we can adjust things toward social in order to help really elevate the brand, um, there are plenty of different things going on in the background um, and, and sort of working to keep them all straight and have them support each other rather than sort of working against each other. Uh, it's a balance, but it's also sort of uh, an exciting challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me your thoughts on Fortnite. Okay, we can we can break into Fortnite. Um, it is very funny. I was talking. I uh, uh, so I came down from Pittsburgh earlier today, um, where uh, my dad, lovely man he is, made me breakfast. Um, and I don't remember how I got on the the, the sort of talking about Fortnite uh, sort of path. I will also admit I've never played Fortnite. But uh, I was talking about how at the Game Awards last year, they announced that basically they said Fortnite was the game of the year. Um, and a lot of people were like, 
oh, if this is a this is a you know brawler kind of thing. There's not an overarching massive story like why is this thing game of the year? But there's so many different things that have gone into Fortnite um, that are honestly should be taken as inspirations from also marketers and brands themselves. Um, to, to give some example on that, first of all, I'll back up into that sense that um, if you were to ask me what I think the most innovative and um, potentially impactful industry is at the moment, it is video games and gaming in general. Um, basically, video games and esports essentially are multi-billion dollar industries that are seen to have the highest growth potential essentially of almost any other industry in the, in the course of the next five years. Um, Dallas, for instance, um, where I'm based, um, is building a massive sort of stadium for exclusively esports, where people can, basically teams can come and train, where there's going to be individual um, sort of competitions and things. Um, They're putting a massive investment in this, this idea. Another example, GameStop, just I think two days ago or something like that, um, heavily, heavily invested in um, some esports leagues. Um, so it is, it is rapidly growing and, and changing. Um, and then in that, that aspect of, of Fortnite, what they are doing is paying very close attention to what consumers are looking for and what they want. Um, in this case, what some people may not remember is Fortnite used to, it started as, as a game. It was a four, four person, um, basically zombie or t fortress building, so you build a thing to protect your area um, against zombies. That's how the game started. But what they identified was an opportunity in the marketplace. Around the same time that they launched Fortnite, um, there was a game called Player Unknown's Battlegrounds that came out. That was what's now known as a battle royale. 100 people basically all duking it out at once. Um, and very quickly, Fortnite you know, identified some things, and they pivoted what they had already done, keeping some things like um, the sort of cartoony, fun graphics, and even the sort of structure building aspect and they went ahead and incorporated that into their own battle royale system. And they did it better. And then they kept watching other things that were happening and going on within the marketplace to really appeal to consumers. Um, from that point, they created a um, basically season subscription passes. Um, I, will, I will liken what Fortnite is doing to something like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that every single time there's a, a sort of new season, they have a little, a little event around it. Like, uh, individual players can go in and watch literally the landscape around them change as something crazy happens. And there's a little bit of a storyline there, but they're taking an aspect that, again, for most games, like if you think of like a Call of Duty, it's just a shooter, but they're giving it a storyline. They're giving people a hook to, to leap into this. Um, there's also, there has been a lot of controversy in video gaming, and honestly, like this is something that maybe in some ways is hitting things like television streaming where people feel nickeled and dimed a lot of times by all these things. It's pay to play, I would have to hop in and try to buy a better gun than everyone else. And Fortnite recognized that and stepped back from it. And it is a very flashy, stylish game. So within Fortnite, the only things that you can buy are, are cosmetics. So you can buy um, dances and you can buy different outfits and things. And within that, they not only took that, but they gamified the aspect of it, um, gamified within a game where um, there are individual challenges every single season that you can do things while you're playing the game to try to earn and unlock cooler new things. So they saw that, again, community um, interest and need, and they took that on. Uh, Fortnite has also partnered with influencers, unlike any video game in the past. Um, uh, basically, the um, so that they've taken Ninja, who is now probably the most popular Twitch streamer in the, I would say, the world is my guess, um, he recognized sort of uh, some of the fun of Fortnite, dove in, and they helped support him in that. Um, a great thing that happened last year was Twitch saw um, a single, basically the largest streaming event of, of all time, and it was not planned. It was basically Ninja sent out a tweet, and the tweet was, hey, I'm playing with some fun friends you might know tonight, you should watch. Those friends ended up being uh, Drake, rapper Travis Scott, and the Steelers' Juju Smith-Schuster. Um, and the four of them played Fortnite together, and people hopped immediately in to watch the stream, and it blew all viewership out of the water. 
Um, and Fortnite has continued to support events with individual influencers like that. Another example of that is they recently, uh, I guess a month or two back, partnered with the uh, musical artist Marshmallow, who is probably one of the, at least from a YouTube perspective, most rising sort of, uh, sort of stars within that framework. I think right now he has, I believe he's dipped under the top 25 most subscribers on YouTube. But in partnering with Fortnite, he hosted, um, from my knowledge, uh, unless it happened in Second Life, which was a thing that was like 15 years ago, um, he hosted a music concert. People hopped into the game, this game that they usually go into to, again, compete against other players, and, and they could go into a specific area that was a concert. And you had Marshmallow's digital avatar as he, um, somewhere else in the world, basically did his music live into the game and people from all around the world where you normally, you know, with these events, you'd have to fly somewhere. It's, it's a little harder to get to. They could hop immediately into this game and into this space and they could uh, essentially, you know, dance and party and play with everyone else. Um, and, and again, it was, it was a music concert that happened digitally. And why would this game do that? That doesn't support like the, the, you, know, the, the, the you know, the fighting aspect or these things. Um, but it gives people an experience they haven't had before, anything they want. Another thing that Fortnite has done is they've made that experience open to everyone. It is a free to play game. Anybody could jump into it for free right now. There's absolutely no barrier to entry. And when I say no barrier to entry, there's really no barrier to entry. Um, Fortnite is now available on PlayStation, Xbox, PC, and mobile. You can play Fortnite, this again game that was originally made for PCs, for game consoles, on your phone. And not only can you do that, there's cross compatibility, which is something that the video game industry has somewhat been against for a long amount of time, but Fortnite helped break down those walls. And you could right now be playing Fortnite on your, maybe wait till I'm done, but you could be playing Fortnite on your phone against somebody who's playing on a PC. But you could also choose, oh, that person on the PC has a keyboard and things are probably gonna be better than me. You can choose not to do that. And you can sort of, again, set up the kind of experience that you want to have. And in Fortnite's ability um, as, a, as a game studio to identify all of these individual different things that marketers use honestly every single day to help improve their own products and strategies, and they've been able to identify what people want and pivot on the dime, that's what truly makes it the definitely game of the year, if not game of the decade in some ways, because they've taken um, you know, gaming and they've made it something that is extremely accessible and they've made it um, you know, something that is an option for everyone. Um, and that's some of my thoughts on Fortnite. So after your team goes through all the stats that you aggregate, mm -hmm. um, what does the process look like for uh, making suggestions for like either content or campaigns to YouTube? Absolutely. So in marketing in general, it is relationships are absolutely everything, um, and we've worked uh, you know very hard and also very well with all of our clients um, to to understand not only like what they like to see and what they, they like to, to read, but, but how they like to, to in, ingest uh, content and data and things like that. Um, in working with, with our YouTube clients, there's been times they've been like, like, Alex, we appreciate everything you're doing, but like, there's a lot of words on this page, and, and you know, especially executives, they have such limited time to really try to ingest these things. Can you help you know, make it simpler, make it really obvious what, what it is that we should attempt to do? Um, so with that, we, um, I'm already losing your question, I'm so sorry. Um, but with that, we are um, you know, working closely with our clients to help them understand, ex again, exactly those details of, of what they need to do. Um, we, a lot of it is based in reporting, so it's based in, um, since we work for YouTube uh, as well as Google, we have things based in like Google Slides, all sort of digital environments like that. Um, but we work closely with them to, to give them these sometimes presentations. So sometimes it's a couple decks. Sometimes it's just like a document. Sometimes um, it's like a small you know, text-based report. Sometimes it's just an email. An example of an email, um, we are currently, uh, YouTube Music is going to be live streaming both weekends of Coachella on um, YouTube Music, on, the, on their platform. Um, so go watch. Uh, but uh, uh, there's uh, again, a number of artists there and a number of partnerships that we have with some of the artists. Um, yesterday, Ariana Grande, it was a big little mini viral moment. She had uh, been talking with a fan and the fan had said, have you ever heard of the band Blackpink? Um, it is an all-female K-pop band. 
Um, and, and she was like, yeah, I hope to, hope to watch them on the second weekend. Um, so, you know, that's something that I went ahead and shared with the client. It's just sort of like, hey, this, this is something that, um, just in general that, that, you know, she is excited about. Like, if there's anything we could help to facilitate that, wouldn't that be cool? Um, and if not, that's fine too. Um, but it also helping them be aware of, of the different things that are happening all the time. Um, most of those cases I talked about when Drake joined um, Ninja on that streaming, when Marshmallow uh, was in Fortnite, those are things that I uh, essentially take and I write a couple things out saying, this is something cool that's happened um, from the Marshmallow end. That has something to do with music. So you know, make sure and share that to the music team. Um, from the Ninja and the, uh, that other end, that has also a gaming reference. So help share that with uh, YouTube's gaming folks so they can have these ideas, not only of what's happened, but always include a sort of insight or recommendation, that, that extra nugget. Always go that extra step to let them know, um, have you thought about doing this as, as the next thing? Um, and different things like that, that's what, again, continues to build that relationship and helps them uh, help open up not only what they want to see, but what we can help give them. Uh, it is truly in marketing a partnership. Uh, given that uh, analytics is something that you know, obviously a lot of us would be interested in because we're here, mm -hmm. um, and most of us are undergrads, is there something that we can do as undergrads if there isn't a program at our school um, that can kind of get us involved in analytics? Like obviously not in depth, but something yeah. that kind of gets us on the surface. That way when we go and apply for a job or get a job, we're not you know, brand new to the whole idea. Absolutely. Well, yeah, and that's and I'll, I'll be honest. Some of that's some of that can be tough, but it, it's even to the standpoint of, um, let's say maybe you work in the service industry. Um, does does the restaurant you work at have uh, a social presence? Have you considered like suggesting, hey, could I, you know, maybe maybe try managing your Facebook account um, or things like that? Um, sometimes you do have to get creative with it because again, the data internships and things like that are are a little more dime a dozen and can be harder to find, um, but. It, it's also, to, again, sort of thinking creatively. You can sort of do it on your, on your own if you wanted, and very easily on Twitter. Um, something that's, that's fun for me on Twitter that I did not realize for a while is you can do very unique searches in that Twitter search bar. You can say, I want to see only a certain amount of, basically, tweets from a specific person between these days. Um, I don't remember the exact variables. Google it. Um, hashtag client. Um, but, uh, and, and you can take that and, and maybe come up with, again, some of your own insights on, on what, some, you know, what, what is occurring. And, and I think in, in that case, again, that creative aspect of, of, yeah, I haven't gotten the opportunity to do this, but I'm really curious about, about some of these things. Um, and and you know, here's my resume, but here's also a PDF on like, um, you know, here's a cool thing that I'm personally passionate about. I'm very lucky that I get to work in fields and uh, give intelligence on industries that I find really interesting and that I'm really passionate about. Um, and take that passion and show that, yeah, like, I can, I can look at some of these things, do these things too. So, again, maybe not the, the best uh, answer in that case to, to give you a, the jump in, but um, there are opportunities everywhere. And a lot of the times, you have to sort of make your own. So. Are there any other questions? What are the specific advantages and disadvantages of working with a sub-brand of a major brand which has a strong rec name recognition? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So um, from, a, uh, from a, let's see, we'll start with the advantage uh, standpoint. Um, an advantage is obviously like these brands have uh, a number of different resources in, internally. Um, and we have, um, the way in some ways that, that benefits us, um, they give us a little more uh, leniency on the different ways we can look at things. So they're, they too are generally very curious about what, what can happen to help um, improve their overarching brand. So we have the opportunity at Methods of Mastery, uh, we have tons of different tools when it comes to research, when it comes to you know, video views. We use about, I think it's right now we're hitting about 12 different um, sort of industry tools that we are using to track different types of metrics and different things. Um, uh, and then sort of uh, past that point of, again, having sort of an opportunity towards uh, curiosity, um, sometimes these brands have some, some data historically about these things. Um, they, they have the opportunity where they're not sort of coming in blind. YouTube Music was an interesting case because 
we did start out without a lot of benchmarks. Like some of these first events and things we did, we didn't have like exactly one-to-one -one things to compare them to. Um, but uh, another advantage in that case uh, of working with a big brand is being able to then, um, they're in so many different spaces that different things that you learn um, potentially, uh, well, yeah, different things that you learn from uh, essentially just regular things you're reading. So like I read articles every day that I'm like, that actually does apply to YouTube. Um, back, to the, uh, back to the whole gaming aspect, um, in the past two weeks, I think, Google has announced its own sort of gaming platform called Stadia. Um, and then Apple had their large event, and while they didn't announce a full gaming platform, they announced uh, Apple Arcade, a sort of mobile area that collects a number of different sort of mobile games um, and gives like a subscription service for kind of like arcade games. Um, and not just arcade, but oh, not just arcade, but uh, in general, like um, just indie games that you might not have bought individually, but you have a chance to, to sort of see them in general. So. Um, so with that case, again, very, very interesting. Another one that you probably saw on the client list was Capital One. So in watching the Apple event, I never thought one of the biggest things that was announced, which was Apple Card, uh, basically a credit card from Apple, would ever apply to Capital One. Um, but it turns out that Apple is potentially a new competitor in the financial services space. Um, so, so there's a lot of, um, again, when working with those larger clients, um, a lot of opportunity to really think outside of the box into what, what could be important. Um, some, of the, um, some of the potential downsides are like, these are big brands with big reputations. In some cases, um, so sometimes their reputations for good things, sometimes for bad things. Um, and in the case, I'll, I'll say with YouTube music, people know YouTube and, and that education is actually a little more difficult rather than let's say, so the music service title came up uh, semi out of nowhere. I think it existed as something before, but Jay-Z bought it. He got on stage with a bunch of celebrities. They launched it, everybody was like, okay, title. That's a music service. When I say the words YouTube music, you're like, okay, yeah, somebody's listening to Shawn Mendes on YouTube. That makes sense. But that's not the product. So being able to, um, th there's sometimes a bit of a, a, an educational hurdle that you have to make to help let people know that, no, maybe this thing is, is different than what you already think. You already have a pre-established notion of what YouTube is, of what Google is, um, and helping show them that like, it happened to be so many more things with Apple they happen to be a financial services company, evidently now, um, it can be a challenge to, to also gain trust in a new area. Luckily, a lot of people, for Apple's case, have been using Apple Pay already, so it's a, a bit of a next logical step, but which, do you trust, I guess you trust Apple with your credit card information, but do you trust Apple to be your credit card? Maybe that might give some people some pause. Um, so so it, there's a lot of those, those sort of hurdles where, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity, but at the same time, there are challenges that especially much smaller companies um, would not have even thought of yet, so. Anyone else? All right, well, thank you so much for being Absolutely. here. Absolutely, thank you all. It's been great. On behalf of West Virginia thank Virginia you. PRSSA, we would like to say thank you for helping take a step in our future. Um, and. Um, so we're going to be heading into our next session, the Leadership Summit at 3.15. So everybody is welcome to stick around. Thank you again so much. And another Absolutely. Thank round you of applause for Alex McPherson. <laughs> so again, you guys are welcome to just like take a break, stretch your legs, and like talk to each other and everything. But when you guys come back, let's all like move forward to the front. And it's not just for students. It's for anybody who wants to learn about leadership. So if you're an advisor, if you're a professor, we really do encourage you to stay. So just move up to the front, though, so we're all yeah, together. Help. <laughs> Yeah.